good morning, church. How we doing? Oh, my goodness. You all are not caffeinated. I'm very caffeinated. Good morning, church. How are we doing? There we go. Hey, so I don't know. My name is Rashawn Dozier. I am from the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. I am a keynote speaker. I do leadership development all across the country. But the coolest thing that I get to do is stand in a pulpit and deliver God's word. Amen. Like to me, there's nothing greater than being in the presence of God with men and women of God going after the things of God. In fact, I treat coming into God's house like my kids treat going into Target. <laughs> oh, that got something out of y'all. Now let's talk, okay? I share way too much of my business. My wife is watching on Facebook right now. Hello, Michelle. Yes, I'm going to air out our family business again. I love you. <laughs> my kids, like, they don't just go into Target like regular kids. They get told no. My kids go into Target with an energy and an excitement. We pull in, it's like, ah, Target! Mm, because they know. They just know if they go in there, oh, they're coming out with something. They're leaving with something. They just know it. So there's this, there's this energy. There's this excitement. But there's this expectation that something on the inside of there is going to do something for me. And so when I come into the house of God, there's an energy, there's an excitement, but most importantly, there's an expectation that God can do something today that changes everything for me. Amen? And so, yes, if I'm a bit energetic, I apologize. This is target for me, y'all. All right? I believe that God's going to do something. And so let's do this. We are going to get into the Word of God today. And a couple promises. Can I make a couple promises? I can't promise that it's going to be transformational. That's between God and, and the Holy Spirit and you. But I am going to sweat. Is that okay? It's gross. It's not anointed. Don't touch it. Just stay away from it. If you have disinfected wipes in your purse, I'll take one or two to wipe up the stage when we're done. Anyways, open your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of John chapter 5. We're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. When you're there, say, There! Okay, stop, time out. Woo! Flag on the play. Okay? Speaking of flag on the play, Ravens fans in here or Commanders fans? Ravens fans, raise your hand. Ravens! There we go right there. They, they, hey, I know, so, so I'm a Commanders fan until we don't make the playoffs as usual, and then I'm a Ravens fan. <laughs> Something wrong with that? Okay? And not all of us Commander fans? They did hurt my feelings the other night. I believe they're going to rebound and have a very good season. But the commanders pray for us, right? This is, the, it's just when the pain starts. And every year I'm done with them until I'm not, and then I'm done again. The cycle continues. Anyways, you all said that you were there. I need to know, do I have honest Christians in the room? So when I said, when you get to John 5, verses 1 through 9, say there. And you all said there. And I need to know a couple of things right now. Who was actually there in their physical Bible? Raise your hand. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. Look at you, Christians. Who got there in their phone? Raise your hand. You see how easy that is? I still, I preach from this thing all the time. I still don't know where everything's at. But on my phone, I'm there right now. Okay. So my real Christians, the ones that still have a real Bible, bless you. Pray for, the, pray for the rest of us who are using technology. I will say this, though. iPhone, raise your hand. Uh-huh. This is my brothers and sisters. If you have an Android, I th there's going to be a prayer team up here at the end. <laughs> We're praying for deliverance, okay? That God shows you something, gives you revelation. I have ADHD. John 5. <laughs> God, please help me. John 5, verses 1 through 9. This is going to be our foundational scripture Let's read it, and we will pray. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. There, now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate Pool, which in Aramaic means Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, blind, lame, paralyzed. Now, if you have verse 4 in your Bible or on your phone, raise your hand. See, there's not a lot of hands that went up because in most of the translations, verse 4 is not there. Verse 4 is not there because we don't know exactly what people thought. But for the most part, it's more or less legend 
that the folks sitting around this, this pool, the paralyzed, the lame, felt as though every so often an angel would come down from heaven. They would stir up this pool, and whoever could make it there first and get into the water could be healed. And so that's left out of the majority of translations, but I wanted to lay that out there in case it's not in your Bible. So that's what's happening. The people that are paralyzed, they're blind, they're lame, and they're waiting for the pool to be touched by this angel. So maybe, just maybe, they can receive healing. Verse 5, one who was there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else, go, someone else goes down before me. And in verse 8, Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you for this opportunity to lean into you, God. Give us revelation. Meet us where we're at, God. Convict us. Help us to see you in a new way, God. I'm grateful to serve my brothers and sisters this morning. I'm so honored for the opportunity to be here, God, and we're grateful for you. We love you. We give you glory and honor, and then we pray. Amen. Raise your hand if you're a person who gets hot easily. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, that's me, okay? So imagine this. Imagine going to a place that on record has been 134 degrees. Because, you, like, you're like, is it, are you referring to hell? No, but it sounds close, doesn't it? 134 degrees. I'm talking about California's Death Valley. The hottest recorded temperature on earth ever, 134 degrees. Like, who would ever want to go there? Raise your hand. Uh -huh. I, I, I'd even be afraid to pass through there in a car with air conditioning. Just in case God said, I got to break you down and teach you a lesson. <laughs> 134 degrees. Now, scientists love studying this area. They call it the, the most, one of the most dormant places on earth. Not a lot of life there. Not much of anything grows there. There's no animals there. Life can't be sustained in a place like this. In fact, they only get about one inch of water every other year. Nothing grows there. Nothing lives there. That changed in 2004. There was six inches of rain in about a day and a half that fell in the winter of 2004. And so when researchers went back in the spring of 2005, they saw hundreds of acres of beautiful yellow wildflowers everywhere. They couldn't believe it. They didn't, this is a dormant place. There's nothing grows here. They're trying to figure out how is this possible? In a place like this, that life could grow. And what they realized is that this place had, somebody say it, potential. Wow, man, this is crazy. Is the mic working? So this, you can talk in church. It's okay. I'm going to talk a lot today. Somebody say it with me. Potential. There we go. That there was potential in the soil. No, they couldn't see it. There was no signs of it before the water touched it. But when the water got a hold of the thing that was in the ground, life happened. Don't miss what I'm saying. There's potential on the inside of things that even when it looks like potential is not there. That there's something that happens when living water touches something with potential, things begin to grow in God's name. There's potential. And even more so, there's potential on the inside of each and every one of us. I don't know what that potential is, but we have potential to do more, to be more, to grow more, and not just for us. Like, this is not a motivational self-help presentation where you can be more and do more and go get everything. No, 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 no. No. I do want a new pontoon boat, though, so I am praying for that. <laughs> That's like on the side. I just need to be transparent and get that off my chest. No, no, no. Me being more and doing more is not about me. It's about me being more effective for God's kingdom. 
You being more and doing more is not about you just having more to have more. It's about you being more effective to be used for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Potential. It's down on the inside of each and every one of us. And not only do I know that, not only does God know that, but the enemy knows that. Satan understands that you have potential to bring souls before Christ so that he can have his way. He knows that if you stepped into your potential, that revival starts at your place of work. He understands that if you step into your potential, your generations change, legacies change, your last name changes. He understands your potential. So he's after it. He's after not who you are now, but who you can become. And so if you ever feel like, bro, why am I fighting these outrageous battles right now? God, what did I do? Okay, yes, okay, God, I forgot to scan one item at the self-checkout. Okay, a lot of honest and integrous Christians in here. <laughs> you ever feel like I'm fighting battles sometimes? Like, why am I fighting a battle that feels this heavy? God, what are we doing here? Because the battles you're fighting is the size of your gifting and your calling. And the enemy's saying, listen, you're fighting this big battle because you have big potential. I find it so interesting that in the scriptures, whenever there was a king who was threatened by what God was doing, or that he hears that God's going to raise up a, a, a man or a woman, he would immediately begin trying to exterminate the threat before it became a big threat. What are you talking about, Rashawn? If the enemy is going to take care of a huge threat, he's going to do it in its infancy. He's not going to wait for you to start lifting weights and try to fight you. No. He wants to do it in his infancy, which is why you see so many kings in the scriptures trying to kill babies. Before they became the men and women God had created them to be, it's just easier to take care of it when it's smaller. And so the enemy, to try to separate you from your potential, oftentimes does it in a way that you don't know. You're looking for it in the physical. Might I add that he does it in a place that you may not be aware of right now. He does it in your mind. Because if the enemy can get in between you and your potential, he can wreak havoc in the kingdom. So he does it in your mind. This is why I love Romans 12 too. I love Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Somebody say transformed. transformed. Yes, there we go. By the renewing of your, somebody say mind. By the renewing of your mind. And once we transform our mind, then we, we will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our minds, church, have to be transformed. The war, the battle, and I'll be real, the battles that I'm facing aren't necessarily even physical. They're mental. I'm still fighting demons from my childhood. Can I talk? I still feel like my dad didn't want me when I was a little boy. I still feel like I'm not good enough most of the time. I'm still insecure. I still struggle to, to feel like I'm not enough. Damn. And the enemy, it's just watering those seeds because doubt has potential too. Because doubt starts the seeds, and if you water it long enough, if you listen to the demonic voices long enough, those doubts, seeds become oak trees. And I still have some that I'm trying to cut down. Because the battle is in my mind. The battle is for me to stay on this level so I can't step into what God's called me to be. Does anybody in here struggle in their mind sometimes with doubt, with insecurities? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I don't want you or me to allow the enemy to paralyze our potential. I just want to speak from that premise this morning, if that's okay. Paralyze potential. I believe every single person in here has potential on the inside of them, but I believe that part of it is probably paralyzed. And if we can just look at what Jesus, Jesus has given us the blueprint to set our potential free. Can I share it? Oh, we're going to get back to it. The first point is mind. I want to talk about that. Write that down. The war is in our mind. 
Jesus and the disciples have just gotten into Jerusalem. They're there to celebrate a Jewish festival. And they're coming into town and they're passing through the sheep gate. But there's this huge pool, this pool of Bethesda. And there's these five huge colonnades. Now, they're like gazebos, these huge colonnades where people will sit underneath of them to shade themselves from the sun and the weather as they're waiting for the pool to be touched. And there's not just some disabled people. There's not just some paralyzed people. There's thousands, theologians believe, thousands. And these people would have oftentimes been, been met by the company of a family member or a friend that would just sit with them and be with them. But as, as we begin to study this, this, this area would have had a lot of despair. So energetically and emotionally and spiritually, there was this, this low vibrational frequency. Also physically, it smelled and it just was not a pretty place to be. And in fact, we know that Jesus could have walked around this and not even gone through it. But who knows that Jesus doesn't avoid things that he needs to touch. Who knows that when you look in the mirror, you thank God that Jesus did not avoid troubled things. He did not avoid things that were lowly. He actually touched you and touched your life. I thank God for that. I'm not in this position today if God avoided people who didn't deserve his grace and mercy. Amen? I don't even stand here. And so Jesus is attracted to things like this. He's actually walking into this place. There's thousands of people. And Jesus and the disciples, now, I'm going to speak from the disciples' perspective. They're probably, oh, Jesus, hey, bro, we can actually, there's a way we can get an Uber from here and go straight to the location we need to get to. Obviously, there's no Ubers. Let me just stay in my imagination for a moment, please. Like, the disciples are probably like, hey, we don't have to go through here. And Jesus is like, no, this is... We're called to the sick. We're called to those who are hurting. We're called to the broken. Church, I say that we're called to the sick. We're called to the broken. And as much as I love church, I recognize what we do here should impact what we see out there. We're called to this. We come here to get equipped and get what we need. But we're not called to just do church. We're called to be the church. We got to go to it. And so Jesus is going to the people who need him. And Jesus is walking. And imagine Jesus seeing this man on the ground, and all the people that Jesus could have gone to, he goes to this man? Imagine Jesus is coming, and he asks him a question that sounds disrespectful. It really does. It really does. Jesus sees him. This man had been there for 38 years. And when Jesus sees him lying there, verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him lying there, and he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, Jesus says, do you want to get well? Imagine that. Could you, could you imagine the audacity, seemingly, of Jesus? Brother, I've not moved in 38 years. Do you think I want to get well? Imagine if, if Jesus said to me, Rashawn, do you want the commanders to win more than four games? Jesus, what do you think? <laughs> I'm 36. They've not won it forever. Yes. <laughs> do you want to get well? But I love when Jesus asks questions. This is, an, uh, this is the word. This is God made wrapped in flesh. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He knows the answer. When Jesus asks a question, when God asks a question in the Scripture, it's not a matter of location that they need to know. They need to know, do you know? Self-evaluation. Do you know? Do you want to get well? Look inside. Now, this man, talking about his mind, let's think about his mindset. 38 years. Ugh. He's on this mat for 38 years. He's on this mat. So imagine when you're on a mat and your circumstances look away. And your situation and everything around you looks away. You start to make choices that look like the things that you're seeing around you. That's why it's so important to be in the right environments. Because Exposure creates expansion. Your environment will influence the choices you make. In the middle of the word influence is the word flu. It's contagious. And now for 38 years, this man has made choices 
based on his circumstances and his conditions. And the dangerous part of being on a mat, the dangerous part of making choices from your circumstances and situation, if you do it long enough, it becomes a habit. Now it's habitual. Now I don't even have to think. I'm just, this is my habit. I make decisions like my circumstances, like my situation. Now my marriage has been in a situation so long, we have a habit of just giving each other the silent treatment. I'm going to talk. Now we, we have a habit of ignoring each other and escaping to different rooms and being on social media. We have a, a, a habit of di- talking to each other disrespectfully in front of the kids. It's a habit. And when you do it long enough, it's automatic. Now it's down in your subconscious. Now you don't even have to think about it. You just do it. That's why you notice, are you telling yourself to breathe right now? No, it's automatic. It's a response. And our choices and habits, if left to it long enough, it becomes automatic. But the dangerous part about this man beyond this map, it wasn't just automatic. It was his identity. He identified as his conditions. Have you ever been in a season that lasted so long that you just identified as the thing that you went through? Hmm. I'm just sick. Yeah, I'm just like this. I'm just an angry person. Yeah, I just tell people exactly what I, I don't know. It's just who I am. It's your identity. And your identity does not come from the things around you. It actually comes from Christ. Your identity is in him. But when you're on the mat of life so long, you make choices like that. It becomes a habit. It's automatic. It's your, your identity. And then it's just your nature. Choices. Habits. Automatic, identity, nature, C-H-A-I-N, it's a chain. And some of us, church, are chained to mats that we don't tell anybody about. Some of us are chained to things in our lives that we don't share with people, but we're chained to insecurity. Some people are chained to lust. Some people are chained to demonic vices, and you don't know why, and I'm asking you, can you just give it to Jesus? You're chained to it. So it's not just a matter that this man is on the mat. He's been there for 38 years. My question to you is how long have you been on your mat? What is the mat that you've been on? And so when Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? He was asking him because the man's experience for 38 years has been one thing. And if Jesus brings healing, it's going to require something from him. For 38 years, he's been in a position of a man who's absolutely helpless. When Jesus says, do you want to get well? Do you want to be well? He's saying, if something comes to you, something's going to have to come from you now. Something's going to have to come from you. If I heal you, do you know that there's going to be responsibility connected to that healing? That there's things that you're going to have to do now. It's not just enough to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I was just talking with Pastor Larry earlier. We didn't get saved for heaven. Newsflash. Are you serious, Rashawn? Seriously. Because if we got saved for heaven, we would have gotten called home as soon as we got saved. We got saved to bring heaven to earth. And to be as effective in the kingdom every single day as we can until God calls us home. And so, yes, we accept the gift of salvation and eternal life. But because I've accepted the gift, now there's a responsibility that comes with it. There's something that has to come from me now. Yes, oh my goodness, we want better marriages. We want better relationships with our kids. We want to be more impactful in the community. And those things are great. But what responsibility are you willing to take on with that? This man's mind was warped. And the question of do you want to be well, Jesus is challenging his mind. The next thing we see here is attitude. Somebody say attitude. His attitude around it. Check this out. John 5, verse 7. When Jesus says, do you want to get well, the answer should have been, absolutely. He says, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone goes down ahead of me. Your attitude is nothing more than a set of beliefs and ideals that you have. This man believed that he was a victim. He had been on his map so long, he had taken on a complete victim identity. Jesus is offering him healing. 
He's offering him a brand new life. And this man couldn't answer the question because of how he saw himself. Church, how do you see yourself? What is your attitude? Jesus is offering him the very thing he needs, but he saw himself as the victim. He says, nobody's going to help me into the pool. Nobody's helping me. Nobody's doing this for me. And my question, church, as my heart hurts, as I travel the country and I talk to people and I'm in different churches and I'm in conference rooms with people, I see a spirit of victimhood in our culture. That everybody's pointing to the problem, and everybody's pointing to what needs to happen, and everybody's saying somebody needs to fix it, and everybody's saying, but nobody's saying, God, send me. Oh, man, oh, oh, oh. well, my life would be better if my spouse just did this or this for me. Or I would be further along in my career if my boss wasn't a jerk, or if this person didn't do that. And I'm saying, at what point are we going to take ownership? At what point are we going to stop pointing to the problem and say, God, place in me something that I can do something about this? At what point, yes, we want to be healed and we want to be well and we're praying for our nation. God, pray for healing over our nation. Send healing. God said, I'm trying to, but I got to send you. There's not a politician coming to fix this. I mean it. It's the church. It's the church. And we're saying we want this and we want that, but what's our attitude? Do you, want to, do you want to have a healed nation where little boys and little girls are raised by strong, God-fearing moms and dads and loved on by healthy communities? Yes, that's what you want? Then what's your attitude about it? Are you saying, well, God, you didn't send the right politician? God, you didn't, you didn't send the right people to do it? Or are we saying, I want to be a part of the solution? This man was making excuses to Jesus, because he had been on his mat so long, he didn't know how to do anything other than that. And that's why we have to challenge the mass that we're on. We have to look at it and say, God, am I stuck in this psychological and subconscious loop that the enemy's keeping my potential paralyzed? The band can come up. I told you I was going to sweat. Let me just wipe my head. Here. I think the most profound thing that happens here. And sometimes I can, I can look over this as what Jesus did in verse 8. Even with that, Jesus had grace and he had patience. He didn't get mad at the guy for not answering his question. He didn't get mad at him for, for, for being a victim in this situation. Jesus says in verse 8, he says, get up, pick up your mat. And walk. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, again, this man was paralyzed for 38 years. So when you, Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk, he's telling him to do something that is seemingly impossible. Jesus is telling him to do something that he doesn't know that he can do, but I got you. I got to say this. Please lean into this moment. If Jesus is telling you to do it, he doesn't tell you to do something that he's not going to give you the strength for. Jesus is not going to have you do something. He's not going to command you to do something and not give you the strength to do it. And so many of us, myself, God will tell me to do something. And I believe that delayed obedience is disobedience. Because sometimes I'll hear God say to do something, and I look at my limitations, and my insecurities take over, and my doubt sets in, that I'm not immediately obedient, and now delayed obedience is disobedient. Their soul's on the line. Their soul's on the line. And so Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 9, at once the man was cured. At once he picked up his mat and walked. Testimony is my last point. Jesus could have healed him, and he could have left his mat right there. He could have forgotten all about the mat, could have forgotten that he was ever paralyzed for 38 years. He could have forgotten everything. He could have left it there, and he, he could have gone on. But I found it interesting that he also picked up his mat because it's bigger than him. You see, the mat that he's carrying 
It's all about the power of Jesus' healing and his grace and his mercy. And what he got a chance to do because he's carrying the thing that he was once chained to. He's now walking around with this mat that once supported him for 38 years and he's now carrying it and he's walking and the mat becomes his opportunity for testimony. Because I was once here on this mat. I was once broken mentally and spiritually and financially, energetically. I was once there. But one day, a man came to me. He looked at me. He said, do you want to get well? And even though I had doubt, even though I had insecurity, he told me to get up and walk. And the thing that once housed me, it's just a sign of his power and his glory and what he did in my life. And if he can do it for me, then by golly, he can do it for you. Your testimony, church, is important. And sometimes we don't share that testimony because we don't know how people will take us. We don't know what they'll think about us if we're honest and we're transparent. And if we share the testimony, they may not, they may not look at us with the same reverence and affirmation. And, and they may not love us as much. But I say this, I don't care what you all think about me. I'm not here for me. And so when I tell you that I was raised by a single mother and I lived in Section 8 housing, and we didn't have a washer and dryer in my apartment. And so we had to go to the laundromat. And it was oftentimes we did not have $5 in quarters to wash my clothes. So I had to wear the same underwear to school multiple days in a row. I don't care how I look when I say that. I don't care how I look when I say there's times that I waited for my father to come pick me up. And he never came. I didn't think he loved me. I didn't think he wanted me. I don't care how I look when I tell you I struggled. I barely graduated high school. 1.9 cumulative GPA. It's not about how I look. When I tell you that I barely got into college by the grace of God and my beautiful wife, I question her judgment because she, for whatever reason, chose to be with me. When I barely got into college, two years in, I wanted to drop out because they were going to make me take public speaking classes. What? I don't speak before people. I'm going to go work at Lowe's, is what I told my fiance. She said, shut up. You don't even know how to build or do What are you going to do with Lowe's? Good point. I'm going to go take those classes. I'm a mess. I don't have it all figured out. But God took all that. He took my mess. And he says, if you're not afraid to tell it, if you're not afraid to stand boldly on my word, I'll turn that mess into a message. That testimony into transformation. And I don't want you to be afraid to share the moment that God found you on the mat and grabbed you by the hand and led you away from it. That wasn't for you. It was for you to share with his children that are far from him, that are doubting, that are hurting, that are lost. It's not about you. And so often we think that this is about us and this life experience is about us moving away from paralyzed potential and becoming a field full of yellow wildflowers, full of life, full of abundance, full of the unapologetic ability to share our testimony and God's resurrection power and what he can do in our lives and lead people to Jesus. That's what it's about. We talked about mind, attitude, testimony, M-A-T. What's that spell? Man, I thought you were a little smarter than that. M-A-T? Math. Math. There we go. I want you to identify your mat. I want you to get up. I want you to take it. I want you to walk. I want you to proclaim the goodness of God and share the gospel with as many people as possible. Can we do that? Church, I'm grateful for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you for the opportunity to lean into you. God, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for water and seeds of insecurity, water and seeds of doubt. God, may we lean into you, recognizing that you, God, and only you can shift everything in our lives. God, we submit everything to you. And I pray that we lean in to the call that you placed on our lives, the responsibility that we have to go out and reach the loss for you, God. I'm grateful for my brothers and sisters, God. Encourage them for the fire down on their belly to be everything 
that you called them to be, God. We love you. And then we pray. Amen. Thank you, church.